Welcome to another episode of Eberhard Outdoors. Uh, this is going to be a continuation of the scent control videos that I plan on doing, or that I am doing, I should say. And uh, I'm going to read something uh, directly from paper. Uh, this is something I took off the internet, and this has to do with uh, olfactory and basically uh, human odor molecules. Uh, there's a biologist uh, from Mississippi State University, his name is Dr. Bronson Strickland, and uh, he works in Mississippi State's University Deer Lab. Uh, so evidently they do studies on deer. And he describes scent as a generic term for what's known to chemists and wildlife researchers as volatile organic compounds, or VOCs. He explains that these substances originate as organic compounds given off by a specific subject. Uh, VOCs entering the air can come from numerous sources, such as gasoline, diesel fuels, paints, oil, tar, perfumes, all give off their own unique signatures. Once captured, these VOC molecules dissolve into and through the mucus and are transferred to the olfactory epithelium. Uh, the whitetail epithelium is reported to have 297 million olfactory receptors. And again, I'm not arguing that either. In that particular study, it stated that the human had over 5 million, only about 5 million receptors. So obviously, I think we as humans know that because dogs and deer and animals can smell things that we literally can't smell. Uh, these receptors translate the scent signal as electrical impulses up through the nerves and extend through the roof of the mouth and into part of the brain known as the olfactory bulb. What's this saying? It means a deer's nose is directly connected to the parts of the brain controlling memory. It goes up to the part of the brain that describes danger. <laughs> Therefore, it would stand to reason that with age comes wisdom. A nine-year-old buck isn't just theorized to be smarter than a yearling buck. Science says the longer a deer has lived in the wild, the more the deer has learned how to avoid certain VOC signatures and signal them as danger. Uh, kind of just like us. You know, I've said it many times, as humans, we wouldn't mind walking at 2 a.m. through a small rural city near where we live. If you live in rural America, but you wouldn't walk through a crime-laden area in inner city Baltimore or Chicago or Detroit at 2 a.m. because as you grow older, you know those are dangerous places, so you avoid those. Deer do the same thing. As they age, uh, depending on how much pressure is on the property that they reside on, um, they avoid, they learn to avoid danger. We've all heard the phrase, a mature buck is just a different breed of animal altogether. I've said that on many occasions on many podcasts. With respect to scent as deer age, their smell library becomes more defined. I agree I agree with the olfactory. That's obviously a fact, so I have to agree with that. Um, but uh, activated carbon will absorb, just like the scientific testing showed on that, uh, the same exact type of scientific, scientific testing in a lab by a chemist that actually, his job is studying activated carbon. You know, he, he said that 10,000 times more molecules than a human body could produce in 24 hours, the scent lock activated carbon, coconut activated carbon within a scent lock suit absorbed 96 to 99 plus percent of odor and 100 percent of surrogate odor. So I also believe that and I've proven that to myself many, many times. An activated carbon it's not just a burnt tree, it's not burnt charcoal briquettes. Um, activated carbon, it, you know, to make activated carbon, you have to physically take whatever it is, wood, uh, coconut shells, which is what Scentlock uses, um, and it has to be actually heated to 1450 plus degrees Fahrenheit under pressure. So in a, basically a pretty much a lack of air, so under pressure. And then they also use treated carbon, which is taking activated carbon and running it through another total different process to again change the pore structure to make it 
except different size molecules that possibly the activated coconut carbon couldn't. Um, they're trying to close that two and three percent gap at the top where it said 96 to 99 percent they want it to be 99 to 100 percent um, and I think they did that by changing it. Keep in mind that lawsuit that I had discussed on the first video where Sunlock got sued and the clothing was sent to Rutgers that was before they added the treated carbon which they added 33 percent more carbon and it was treated carbon and then they also added about five plus percent of zeolite to what they were already using in activated carbon so that was done since that Rutgers study which was 96 to 99 plus percent in absorptivity using 10,000 times more molecules than the body could produce in 24 hours so uh, that tightened up that gap even a little bit more. So on the first video, I explained all the issues I had when uh, for the first 35 years that I bow hunted as far as you know, having to hunt the wind in areas that I wouldn't hunt because the right wind was never there during the times I had off work to hunt them. And I quit setting up on ridges and in valleys where thermals and wind swirling, you know, it, it just moved the wind around all the time. I'd never hunt down a tree line, uh, especially when there's foliage because wind would hit the tree. Some of it would slide down the tree line and if it hit a corner, it'd swirl, you know, just like a whirlpool in a river and go all directions even into the woods. So, so anyway, let me explain uh, hunting without having to pay attention to the wind because it makes it a lot easier. And keep in mind, you can do the same thing. It's very simple to do. You just got to take a little time and learn how to do it. Um, when I'm postseason scouting, I prepare the best tree suited for the location with zero concern of wind direction. Back when I paid attention to wind, I would oftentimes set up in trees well off to the side of an area because the predominant wind during the rut phases was going to be out of the north northwest. So I had to set up in a tree that 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 type of wind direction was. Uh, it was suited for the tree I was going to pick. Anymore, that's not the case. If I'm at a primary scrape area, if I'm at a destination white oak or an apple tree, um, whatever whatever the scenario is, I prep the tree that's going to give me the most cover and the most height within shooting distance of all the sign at the destination site. I don't have to prep something off to the side and just take advantage of one or two runways feeding the destination. I take total advantage of the destination site because I don't worry which way the wind's blowing. I have a daily and seasonal hunting plan and it's based on the location sites and I hunt them accordingly. You know, not having to pay attention to the wind just totally changes when and where and how you hunt any location because the wind doesn't make any difference. I prepare locations on ridges and saddles, which I never used to do in the, in the past. Uh, I prepare trees on tree lines. Maybe if there's a tall CRP field where deer sometimes will feel comfortable moving down the edge of the, you know, in the actual CRP, but close to the edge of the tree line where they got a quick exit. Uh, I never used to do that in the past because of the swirling winds created by the tree line. So I prepare locations in places where I wouldn't even consider hunting in the past because thermals and swirls always would blow me. And then, you know, spooked the deer. And then it just made that deer become harder to kill because he became then he became more nocturnal. Uh, entry and exits are no longer dictated by, by wind direction. You know, all I worry about on entry and exit locations is whatever noise or visual I'm making. If the wind's blowing in the direction from me into the interior of the bedding area or the security cover, I don't worry about it anymore. Uh, I have no concern about non-targeted deer passing by me and being downwind and spooking. That is not a problem anymore. I have deer all the time. You know, they come in from upwind and then they'll move by the tree and then they're gonna end up downwind of me. And, and you know, in the past, they would spook. You know, once they get downwind of me 15 or 20 yards and my thermals go down to them and, and they, they could smell me and then they would spook. And spooking a deer, doesn't matter which side of the tree is it on, spooking a deer is pretty much negative to killing a mature buck on that particular set. Because typically when they spook, they either run and make noise, or they, if it's a doe, they snort or stomp their feet and make noise. 
So they give out a pretty big signal that there's danger over here, don't come this direction. I hunt my all important rut phase locations based on sign and activity and not by wind direction. So if I post season scout and I set up on an awesome primary scrape area that I'm gonna hunt during the rut phases, um, you know, I'm hunting it because I'm expecting that after I've done a little bit of a pre-season speed tour and seen how the food situation was on my early season locations, um, you know, and if it's correct and I think the scra that scrape area is going to be active, you know, I'm going to go in and hunt it during the rut phases when I think it's time to hunt it. I'm not going to worry which way the wind's direction's blowing. Deer activity and timing dictate hunting with zero attention to the wind direction. A lot of times you'll be hunting an area and you'll notice activity over in another area where you may have another location set up. And I never worry if I see activity, I'm gonna probably be over there the next day and not worry about the wind. You know, I'm not saying, oh man, there's deer activity over there by my other location. Now what way is the wind gonna blow? What day is the wind gonna blow where I can go hunt that location? I don't care. I just go hunting. Big difference really ups your percentage of kill opportunities. I'm not going to argue the fact, you know, people tell me, well, look at all the deer that get killed with people paying attention to the wind. Of course, there's millions of deer that get shot paying it where people are hunting the wind. I did it for years. I'm not, I'm not ever going to downplay that because that's going to happen forever. But if you can take advantage of the technology and not have to pay to, attention to the wind, your personal percentages are gonna be a lot higher. You're gonna get a lot more opportunities. You know, th that old thought of, well, look how many deer get shot and people pay attention to the wind, people hunt the wind correctly, BS. There's gonna be always, I don't care who you are, deer are gonna be downwind of you at some point in time during the season and you are gonna get blown at, period. Blown at or spooked. Uh, you know, that, that same thought process, you know, I could, I could reverse that. Look at how many people, how many cavemen killed animals with spears, probably with loincloths on. So, you know, if they killed animals with spears and loincloths on, why don't you guys just go out and do that? Go buy yourself a loincloth and go try and run down something or play the wind and get within spear tossing distance of it and kill it with that. You know, there's, there's been things killed with all kinds of weapons during all kinds of scenarios. So blowing smoke up my, somebody yin yang about, well, this guy does it this way without paying attention to wind. You know, I did a podcast with a guy one time and he was telling me how many 180 inches this one dude shot and he doesn't pay attention to the wind. You know, the guy that was moderating or doing the actual podcast, he didn't mention, or he never brought up who this who this guy was, well, he did mention his name, and I'm not going to say it, but he didn't ask the person he was doing the podcast with what the scenario of the hunting property was that that guy had. And that guy had, I think he owns around 800 acres, and he's the only guy that hunts it. So, and he's out there on the property all the time, and he's not shooting deer till over four or five years old. Anytime you have total control over your deer herd, and you're the only one basically on the property, you're the only one hunting it, uh, you know, you, you're gonna be able to get away with a ton because those deer are gonna tolerate all kinds of stuff that they wouldn't tolerate in a pressured area. I can remember seeing videos of Charles Alzheimer. You know, he had a little enclosure in his place in New York and he had videos where he'd walk in his enclosure and he'd sit on a stump and he'd have, you know, 140 inch 10 points come right up to him within 10 yards. Do you think you're gonna do that? So, you know, throwing out these ridiculous thoughts about, well, this happened and this happened, of course, there's always gonna be exceptions, but you have gotta think of the circumstances those exceptions happened in. Um, and that, that one kind of, kind of grinded me a little bit that that podcast guy did not ask him where this guy hunted, what type of ground this guy hunted. He's hunting in a place where there's zero competition. So of course the deer are gonna move differently during daylight hours and they're gonna accept a lot. But anyway, I'm gonna get off that rant. Uh, you know, that's, that's to me is always the goal, is becoming the best that you can be with the technology that's there available for you to use to do that. I would really like it if somebody could please 
give me an intelligent reason why in the world would you not want to not have to pay attention to wind direction? Because that technology is there if you want to take it. In my opinion, I think a deer's sense of smell is probably their number one uh, defense against humans. Uh, obviously, hearing and sight are the other two. But uh, if you can get over a deer, beyond a deer's sense of smell, it's just a huge uh, game changer as far as the more opportunities and the more sightings you're going to have. Because uh, you have to, you know, in, in pressured areas, there's going to be 40 or 50 other deer in the form of subordinate bucks, uh, possibly two and a half year old bucks, does and fawns. There's going to be 40 or 50 of those to every one three and a half or year or older buck. You've got to get by all of those to end up getting a shot at the one you want. And again, activated carbon. Uh, there's thousands of uses worldwide. <clears throat> activated carbon was not developed by a hunting company. Um, it was developed by industries in the 1800s actually. And it's been used <laughs> prolifically ever since for filtration and absorptive uh, absorptive purposes. Uh, to give you some of the worldwide uses, they use it for gas purification, sewage treatment, uh, they use it to absorb radon gas for air quality, uh, They every chemical warfare suit on the face of the earth uses activated carbon to protect the soldiers from chemicals, chemical warfare. Uh, NASA uses it in their space suits for filtration, uh, it's used in water purification, EMT vehicles have activated carbon pills for poison ingestion. Every hospital in the world also uses activated carbon. Uh, it's used for mercury emissions from coal power plants. Um, it's used to filter vodka and whiskeys. The U.S. Department of Energy uses it to store it uh, hydrogen gas. Uh, it's used for gold purification. It's used in the auto industry. It's used on gas masks, uh, dry cleaning processes. And the list goes on and on and on. This is not just some fly-by-night thing, you know, <laughs> that these, all these industries and worldwide governments use because it doesn't work. Obviously it works, or they wouldn't be using it. There's been thousands and thousands of studies on how this stuff works. Um, you don't see these industries and worldwide governmental bodies using baking soda. Of course not. You know, that's what your scent sprays are. Pretty much sodium bicarbonate, which is baking soda mixed with water. Um, and does it have a little bit of absorptive quality? Yeah, very minimal. But to spritz your clothing with it and think that's going to do anything? Seriously? Really? Why don't you go online and try and Google and see how many worldwide industries or governmental bodies use baking soda for absorptive capacities, anything big, as far as large amounts of absorptance, you ain't gonna find it. And as I mentioned before, um, you, if you take one pound of activated coconut carbon particles, and again, they're smaller than a grain of sand, and you took all the interior pores, the macro pores, uh, the exterior surface of every single particle, and you took all of those particle surfaces and you flatten them all up, butted them all up, so it's a flat piece of surface, it'd cover about 34 acres. If you took it in one teaspoon, did the same thing to one teaspoon of activated carbon, it'd cover, I think it's uh, 3 point, or 2.17 tennis courts. That's one teaspoon, a tablespoon, a teaspoon. I think a tablespoon of activated carbon and all, you took all the pores and flattened it out, a tablespoon would cover about three and a half football fields side by side. Uh, so the absorptive capacity of activated carbon is absolutely huge. And when they do that heat process, it actually, it actually gives the activated carbon a, an, an energy, an elect, some sort of an electrical charge where when molecules pass by, it, it actually sucks them in. It, it physically sucks them in and it absorbs them in into the actual activated carbon and they get bonded to inside the pores or on the exterior surface. And then basically 
what happens when you put them in the dryer and I'm gonna go over all that again in another video but when you put them in the dryer to give you an idea you know people say well you can't reactivate carbon you know in the dryer you know what you're absolutely correct you can't reactivate carbon in the dryer because you to reactivate carbon back to its pristine state you got to heat it at 1450 plus degrees while it's under pressure so of course you can't do that in a dryer uh, but you can deabsorb it for more hunting purposes you know it's kind of like a sponge it gets wet it absorbs x amount of stuff um, you're never going to fill it up but it absorbs and then by running it through a dryer cycle you get rid of a lot of the molecules they break free from the bond of the carbon and they exit out the dryer then. and to give you an example of this that you can probably easily understand is you take steel bridges you take steel structure where the interior sides of a building are steel structure or you take concrete highways across the country across the world concrete highways have expansion joints in them. every so far there's a, a there's a gap and there's an expansion joint and steel bridges are the same way every so far along the steel structure you're gonna have expansion joints like the Mackinac Bridge has several expansion joints and they're 12 15 feet wide or long i should say where you've got you know steel that goes like this and when it expands it kind of intertwines and then when it gets cold it shrinks back up because when you get a 80 90 degree sunny day the heat energizes the molecules in the steel the molecules in the concrete you know everything has molecules everything is made up of molecules and basically it energizes them and what happens is when you energize them they move more rapidly and when they move more rapidly they expand it basically causes expansion so you have to have the expansion joints in the highway and in the steel steel bridges or whatever so that it doesn't buckle if you didn't have expansion joints the concrete would actually buckle and crack up if you didn't have the steel expansion joints the steel if it was just butt to butt and something's going to give so the steel is going to bend or the concrete's going to buckle, or the steel structures are going to bend. Um, and keep in mind, that starts happening at 70, 80 degrees on a sunny day. You throw your activated carbon clothing in a cloth in a regular household dryer, which gets to about 150 to 155 degrees. Um, look how much more heat you got, and that does exactly the same thing. It actually energizes the molecules that are attached to the carbon and they start moving rapidly from the heat and then the carbon also starts moving more rapidly from the heat and they break that bond and then a certain percentage of that uh, those molecules are going to exit out the dryer vent so that frees up a lot more space for more hunts and a scent lock suit on average use with proper care and proper storage is going to last about eight to ten years and that's using one suit all the time so if you have multiple suits for different temperature ratings let's say you have three different suits and you use them equally throughout the year um, you know three suits should last you you know 25 to 30 years and they're not that expensive you know that technology the activated carbon technology is not that expensive activated carbon is pretty cheap actually so um, you know, you're not paying, it's probably half the cost of a Sydney coat with zero technology in it, or a Kuyu or whatever. Um, you know, that, that stuff has zero technology and people spend gobs of money on that stuff. Yeah, it's made nice, it looks pretty. I can't believe people spend that much money on stuff with no technology It won't buy something that actually has technology that will help them kill stuff. Uh, but hey, that's me. You've already seen it. If you watch this far into this video, but you saw some electron microscopic photographs of a particle or several particles of activated carbon. Now keep in mind, when you're looking at this cavernous picture, uh, that is a picture of a particle of activated carbon that is smaller than a grain of sand. And it's got that much porosity. Just imagine how many part how many of those particles of activated carbon are in a pound are in a pound and then multiply that cavernous structure by that many particles 
And keep in mind, you are when you're looking at these photos, you're looking at one side of one piece of par one piece of particle. Uh, there's a picture of an activated carbon particle in photos of the interior pores where there are actually molecules bonded to the surfaces of the activated carbon. Um, so that those are kind of interesting, and it, it allows you to mentally picture those molecules under heat expanding and breaking free because it looks like a maggot on a piece of flat surface. Uh, you could you could picture those easily breaking free and a certain percentage of them exiting out the dryer. And when you see the uh, electron microscope picture of the side of the particle of activated carbon, uh, the first time I saw them, it, blew, it just blew my mind that something could be that porous and yet be that small. So molecules are are really, really, really minuscule in comparison to the scope and size of one particle of activated carbon. Yet one particle of activated carbon, if you had it on your finger, you could barely see it. This stuff that I've been doing and putting out there, um, it's not just some fly by the seat of my ass information. This is real information. This is real technology. And it's, it's up to you whether you want to do it or not. Do you want to kill more deer or you want to be lazy? That's up to you. It's just it just take it just depends on how much desire and dedication you have to become a better hunter and, and to have as many opportunities as you can. I spend way too much time scouting, prepping locations, recleaning locations, uh, to just let this sort of technology sit by the wayside and not take advantage of it. You know, to me, I want to take advantage of everything I possibly can. That's why I got into saddle hunting when nobody else did, and that's kind of why I got into the scent lock basically when nobody else was doing that either. I could see the advantages of it and I knew if I could perfect the way I was using it, it would make a big difference in how I hunted and my, my kill rate. And it has. Thank you very much and hit like and subscribe or send me a nasty reply because you are still, no matter what anybody says, you're going to buck the system because if you don't, you'll get castrated by somebody on another forum if you're a part of that forum. Because there actually are forums where if you go on there and you even discuss scent control, uh, you'll get booted off the site. I've had several friends do that. They've went on to some sites and discussed scent control and they don't pay attention to wind and activated carbon and they basically got kicked off the site. So that's how close-minded some people are. But that's the reality of life. I'm used to it, so have a good one.